take uh, the first opportunity to thank you and to thank uh, uh, the, the government and the people of the Republic of Togo uh, for not only accepting us but welcoming us to Lome for this particular meeting and uh, to appreciate the fact of how easy, at least for me and uh, those I have spoken to, it has been for us uh, not just to plan for the meeting but actually to make it uh, to uh, Lome uh, uh, for this particular uh, uh, session of the Governance Institute. Uh, it's absolutely uh, important, at least for Codestria, it was that uh, we are able to gather uh, not just in West Africa, but actually in a country that uh, has become, uh, in many ways, What happened at the beginning of the Governance Institute here at Pedestria? I mentioned the conference in 1980, and we were all in and out of Dakar, my generation, for conferences of one kind or another. It was, there were no boundaries. When uh, Mazanza Frontier said that uh, they have no boundaries, we didn't have boundaries either. If there was a meeting there, we came. If we need to discuss a new idea, we did. So in the market world of those days, we were discussing structural adjustment. What happened to the Lagos Plan of Action? There was anger on the bad report, which had promoted deregulation, marketization, abolishment of market, marketing boards. They thought that African civil servants were paid too highly, and that was the cause of the problem. And they thought that agriculture should be left to be determined by the, by the dictates of the market. Democratic governance in Africa must be constitutive of inclusiveness. And that inclusiveness uh, sh uh, should also be reflected uh, in the voices of those who are around the table in uh, debate. So that's uh, one of the first things that I wanted to preface my remarks with. The second point that I wanted to preface my remarks with, yesterday when I came into the hotel at 3.30, panting, uh, again, a couple of my colleagues said, what has happened? I said, I've just spent three and a half hours. I walked down all the way to Lome, oh Lome. I walked through the market and I walked back. And they said, why? I said, first, I like markets. Uh, almost every city that I go uh, is I try to ground myself that uh, this is incredibly important, but so are uh, the people in the countries that we visited and their everyday lives. And yesterday, uh, in doing that work and going through uh, one of the biggest markets uh, in West Africa, which is the Lome market, um, is to get a sense of the ordinariness of people's everyday life. And the fact that on an everyday basis, 365 days a year, is they live their lives not only in relationship to but in spite of politics. Africa, and perhaps that is also true around the world, but in particular Africa is a graveyard of initiatives and institutions. A lot of them beautiful, but at the end of the day, a year or two, they are gone. So this is, this is really a moment of, of joy and celebration. And uh, in paying tributes to past and present leaders and grandees of the institution, where we can rediscover our audacity. An audacity of thought that will say, we have read your experience. We have seen what is going on with your democracy. We have seen what does not work with your system. 
regardless of whatever thing. You can call yourself mature democracies or whatever. Go ahead, label yourself the way you like. But let us have the audacity to be able to step back and say now, in Africa, what exactly are our priorities around which we shall construct a system of governance that will be able to deliver those priorities? C'est cette leçon de dignité que Tandika donne au chef d'État africain quand il dit « Nous prenons l'argent, mais au Côte d'Estria, nous ne voulons pas prendre n'importe quel argent. » Et ça, c'est l'ADN du Côte d'Estria. Et je pense que cet ADN du Côte d'Estria, quand il deviendra l'ADN de l'Afrique, quand nous pourrons être debout dans la dignité et dire que même quand nous prenons, nous prenons l'argent sur la base de notre propre agenda, on pourra dire un début de gouvernance démocratique. La métaphore de Hamlet, ce que cela nous apprend, c'est que c'est avec des idées fortes qu'on déconstruit les stéréotypes de l'Afrique. On ne peut pas écrire Hamlet sans le presse de Danemark. Ce qu'il fait en même temps et qu'il ne dit pas, c'est que c'est par la culture démocratique, mais c'est par la culture du savoir qu'il déconstruit les stéréotypes sur l'Afrique. C'est cela que nous devons apprendre dans notre communauté. Finir, pour finir. Bayo, tu nous dis qu'il faut avoir l'audace. Il nous faut avoir l'audace d'aller au-delà des concepts. Il nous faut l'audace de penser au-delà du box dans lequel on nous enferme. Il nous faut une audace fondée sur une conviction visionnaire capable d'élargir l'horizon des possibles pour l'Afrique. I want to talk about the gendered nature of the international system because once we agree to enter the international system, the state take on gendered um, uh, characteristics and priorities. And until we kind of engage with that complexity of the gendered state in the international system, I don't know exactly how we can um, prioritize the lives of the people in the market that Ishmael went to as opposed to the neoliberal market. One thing that I think we should also be very careful is this intimate relationship between capital and the state. And this capital and capitalist approach often looks at the devaluation of women, children, people with disabilities, people from different walks of life who are not part of this masculine hegemony. So instead of taking our cues from the international liberal market, maybe we should in fact go with Ishmael and go see the market and understand where those who are often devalued get their priorities from. Then we'll be able to know the rate and the cost of things. We'll be able to know the cost of politics and the cost of everyday life. Um, and set priorities that are more in line with the population that is occupying the space we call Africa. Amartya Sen disait, la démocratie est directement importante pour elle-même et n'a pas à être justifiée indirectement par son effet sur l'économie. On comprend dès lors que la démocratie elle-même a une utilité pour les peuples. Maintenant, indirectement, ce que la démocratie va apporter, c'est un plus. Je vais tenter donc de rappeler les bienfaits de la démocratie dans la sphère purement économique. Comment la démocratie parvient-elle à impacter positivement la croissance économique dans un pays donné La réponse à la question n'est pas chose aisée. Cela est dû naturellement à la complexité de la relation dialectique entre les variables économiques et les variables politiques.
en particulier la démocratie. Mais cela est dû aussi au fait que l'effet de la, la démocratie ou n'importe quel autre système politique change d'un contexte à l'autre. Ce qui a bien marché au Danemark ne va pas forcément marcher au Bénin. Dans certains cas très rares, le Chili, la Corée du Sud et l'Indonésie par exemple, c'est la croissance économique qui avait porté la démocratie. Mais c'était des cas rares. Maintenant, dans la majorité des pays qui avaient progressé, c'est plutôt la démocratie qui avait boosté la croissance. Des exemples, l'Europe de l'Est, la Turquie et un certain nombre de pays d'Amérique latine. Maintenant, quels sont les arguments que l'on peut avancer pour défendre l'idée selon laquelle on doit partir de la politique vers l'économique et non l'inverse. C'est la démocratie qui est censée booster, porter l'économie et non l'inverse. Et si je vais avancer très rapidement, cinq arguments. En premier lieu, on sait tous que pour être pérenne et efficace, les politiques économiques, les réformes économiques ont besoin d'une légitimité. Et seule la démocratie peut offrir cette légitimité à travers un débat, à travers les discussions, à travers un système de vote au sein du Parlement. En deuxième lieu, la démocratie produit la confiance produit l'espoir, produit la stabilité politique, produit un état de droit, produit un système judiciaire indépendant. Bref, tous les éléments indispensables pour faire les affaires. Or, ce sont les affaires qui produisent de la croissance. À cela s'ajoute le fait que ces éléments rassurent également les citoyens et les citoyens au sens économique du terme, ce sont des consommateurs. Et plus on est rassuré, plus on est confiant, plus on consent plus. Et plus on consent plus, plus qu'on gagne en termes de PIB par tête. En troisième lieu, la démocratie réduit le risque pays. Il facilite dès lors l'accès des gouvernements au marché financier international. Il accroît en même temps l'attractivité du pays vis-à-vis -vis des investisseurs directs ou des investissements directs à l'étranger. Si je prends par exemple la Tunisie, ils sont d'être aujourd'hui sur le marché international à 8%. Mais on considère la Tunisie comme étant un pays à haut risque politique. Le Botswana sont d'être à 1%. Et c'est pas rien. Donc c'est important. Et c'est l'argent, entre autres, qui fait le développement. En quatrième lieu, la démocratie comme système ou comme synonyme de liberté politique et civique, l'approche procédurale de Seine, constitue un prérequis à l'émergence des libertés économiques, mais aussi à la protection des droits de propriété. Et comme on le sait tous, la liberté économique et le respect des droits de propriété sont deux éléments fondamentaux pour le développement des activités économiques. En dernier lieu, la démocratie réduit sensiblement les phénomènes de copinage, 
de corruption, de favoritisme, de népotisme, de recherche de rente, bref, les éléments qui sont nuisibles à la croissance économique. The democratization that occurred under the current constitution preserved the authoritarian character of the state in the presidency. And he must have power to lead us through rapid development, building the nation in a heterogeneous context and so on. And consistently, this has been proven to be false. The evidence doesn't bear that out. And it's the same logic you would also see for coup makers, the soldiers who overthrew uh, democratic regimes uh, in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, and even currently, um, have this purpose that a very centralized authoritarian state or power centralized in the is what will bring about economic and social development and build nations out of one. None of this has been proven to be right. And so uh, the hybrid nature of what we are calling the multi-party or uh, constitutional multi-party democracy or multi-party government, it's really not fully a multi-party constitutional democracy. Why do I say that? First of all, if you look at um, what had become the purely authoritarian models, whether it's China, or you look at uh, uh, South Asia, or you look at, um, for instance, Malaysia, which is a prime ministerial system, um, and you look at the West, there is something interesting, and this is the research I did. I wanted to know whether the bureaucracies, the state, the civil service, the public service, and all those institutions allied. Who controls them? Is it, are they insulated from political control? Um, what makes them different from what we see in Africa? And this is what I found. Authoritarian states and democratic states, when it comes to development and the powers of the state, have one thing in common, especially those that have been successful. The public services are insulated from politics of the, the party politics. China does not allow civil servants to join the Communist Party. You cannot be a civil servant and also hold the Communist Party card. But they rather depend on a certain level of meritocracy, competence, is a very rigid system where you must pass the exams and justify your, uh, you know, retention and so on. I find I found the same thing with Singapore. Mm -hmm. That the civil service is not controlled by the uh, party that has dominated Singapore politics. No, you go in there and you must look. They build meritocratic systems. The British system and the German systems and so on are the same. The agents of the state found within the structure of the public service and the civil service have a certain autonomy. In fact, in the case of uh, UK recently, uh, when the UK decided that they wanted to bring uh, refugees to Rwanda, <laughs> you know, um, it shortly, I don't know if it was politics, but there was also a report and a debate that occurred in the UK that said that um, the lady who was in charge of the Priti Patel uh, wanted this policy to be executed by people he had brought, she had brought in as advisors. And that was going against the grain of the civil service, which had people who handled government business as representatives of the state. And so the issues got so nasty that the permanent secretary then took on the issue and decided that the way she was trying to move civil servants was against the law, the administrative law, and took the matter to the administrative court. I didn't know that civil service has a special court to resolve, resolve issues between the civil servants and the political leaders. When the uh, chief director resigned and decided to pursue the case, Boris Johnson said that, well, he has full confidence um, in uh, Priti Patel, the minister. So the case started. And midway, the government threw in the towel and said they will settle out of court. 
And so the civil servants who were threatened and so on got their positions, all right. They remained, but the man, you know, was compensated and he moved on. And that was very revealing for me because in Ghana, in other African countries, uh, the party that won the elections and controls the presidency also has quite significant control over the civil service and the public services. They've come in with their own specialists, legal officers, advisors, and no, there is very little constraint on them on what they can do and what they cannot do. So from that perspective and learning from the British, that's how I took interest in what happens in, in China and so on. I spoke to some of the Chinese uh, uh, colleagues I met in think tank meetings and so on. So if you, if you look at it carefully then, and I like Bio's uh, presentation, the rethinking of what democratization means to institutions, particularly the institutions that serve the purposes of the state. And the state is seen, those institutions are seen as the nation builders, not the political parties. Uh, it's a meritocracy. You just don't fit in or sit there for long if you are not passing your exams regularly and so on. And you must get to a certain level in Singapore where you are now permanent. Otherwise, you fail exams and you are out. They don't do that. I haven't seen any African country that had this kind of feature. At one time, I thought, South Africa had that, you know, um, because of um, the strength of the civil service, as it was said, ANC inherited a very robust civil service and so on. But when the corruption uh, probe was going on um, recently, I've forgotten the name of the judge, it's not the Chief Justice, Zondo, the Zondo Committee, the, the proceedings sh clearly showed that uh, political <laughs> ANC control had penetrated very seriously and that part of the things that had happened uh, just cha has changed the institutions and politicized them. So for me, I think it's important for us to start from the position that uh, it is not the political parties, whether they were the parties led to independence or not, that will bring about the transformation and the nation building project. It is actually the public servants who, in the conceptual nature of things, are agents of the state, they have, must have certain competencies, and they must serve every citizen as equal, given the resources and so on, and not the political parties. In that case, I think that the democratic developmental state concept, which I thought Kodestria started working on, but I felt Kodestria abandoned it too early. And um, one of the questions I asked uh, 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 Professor Bayo is that, what happened to this notion? Because when Kodesha was critiquing uh, structural adjustment programs and so on, and the third wave of democratization, I felt that it was important for them to also draw attention to the fact that it is the institutions that bring about the kind of transformational, economic, and national change, or nation building change. But they just left it. So we've lived with this authoritarian model, which has the semblance of because multi-party elections take place, and you know how elections are stolen, results are manipulation and all that. And I think we need to confront this too. What do we build if we are to find uh, a new wave of democratization, African-led, which says that the classic case shows that institutions of state should not be politicized and controlled by parties. Le concept de démocratie est à historique et n'est pas fondé sur nos trajectoires culturelles et nos dynamiques internes. Je crois que ce que tu dis sur la démocratie dans les collectivités locales, parce que une des dimensions fondamentales de la démocratie formelle, c'est la décentralisation. Les trois piliers, c'est la décentralisation. Euh, c'est la démocratie représentative et c'est l'état de droit. Mais quel rapport avec nous, les mécanismes qu'on connaissait avec ces trois dimensions, ça c'est un débat sur lequel nous devons revenir. Je crois que tout ce que Moshit a dit sur les bienfaits de la démocratie suppose une démocratie qui fonctionne et une démocratie qui est à notre compte. C'est-à-dire une démocratie qui est 
qui serait, et c'est cette forme de démocratie qu'on n'a pas encore connue en Afrique, comme il disait tout à l'heure. Et quand il euh, exposait, moi, je, ça me ramenait au débat qu'on a eu dans la sociologie. Euh, parce que euh, ce débat sur euh, la démocratie, on l'a eu dans le, sur le développement. Euh, si vous voyez euh, l'école de la CEPAL, les premières ruptures, l'école des dépendantistes, dans laquelle Samir Amin a largement contribué, et qui est une ramification de la CEPAL qui a donné Claxo aujourd'hui. C'est-à-dire, c'était toute une contestation de la thèse du caractère à historique du développement et son lien avec le politique. Que là où Rostov nous dit que tous les pays doivent suivre la même trajectoire pour être dans le développement, eux, ils le disaient, mais non, le développement est un concept qui est aussi politique. I think it would be important for us to appreciate the context in which the Governance Institute was born. I think in speaking to the context, we'll be able to appreciate what were the objectives that the Institute was meant to serve. It was in the context in which there was a lot of euphoria and, and, and optimism and triumphalism for liberal democracy that was in the 90s in which there was hope that liberal democracy was going to produce something tangible in the world. Secondly, African countries were steep in, there was a global crisis, but African countries more importantly, and many third world countries were steep in deep economic crisis in the 90s, late 80s and the early 90s. And that was the context in which this institute was born, the Democratic Governance Institute. And what were the purposes to complement what uh, Godwin said I think there were two major objectives that this institute was meant to serve. One is to problematize and interrogate the notion of democratic governance. Not liberal democracy. Not liberal democracy, but democratic governance. On n'a pas la même conception de la démocratie. Or, ceux qui sont pas à l'école sont les plus nombreux, sûrement. Alors, je pense que c'est cette articulation qu'il faut chercher à, à établir. On a des débats intelligents entre universitaires, mais euh, comment est-ce que ce débat peut s'acclimater euh, au plus profond de la société euh, Je pense que euh, ce débat, on ne peut pas faire l'économie. Et tout comme au, à propos de la passe africana, le débat qui a opposé Archie Mafej à Ali Mazeroui, et Mafej qui pense que, et Mazeroui qui pense que pour mettre fin aux guerres tribales en Afrique, il faut recoloniser le continent africain, chose contre laquelle s'est élevé violemment Archie Mafej, et qui a jusqu'à même considéré effectivement Ali Mazeroui et comme un vendu à l'Occident, parce que plaider pour que l'Afrique soit recolonisée est apparu aux yeux de Marfège et comme un, un, un sacrilège euh, qu'il ne faut plus recommencer. C'est un duel épique entre ces deux icônes de la pensée africaine. Et ce genre de débat, on ne peut pas en faire l'économie aujourd'hui, et c'est pourquoi je suis heureux d'être ici à Lomé. Enfin, j'ai l'occasion de, de, de poser des questions, et sans doute de trouver réponse. J'ai toujours pensé, pour terminer, que quand on dit que non au troisième mandat, je ne comprends pas le sens. Si un peuple décide qu'il veut cinq mandats, il est souverain. Il est souverain. Si un peuple décide que le président peut faire cinq mandats, mais le peuple est souverain. C'est la démocratie. J'arrive. Si mais la Constitution dit qu'il faut deux mandats, que le président veut faire trois mandats, là, il faut le condamner. Mais si la constitution du pays opte pour cinq mandats, c'est la démocratie. C'est la démocratie. On sort du cas du Sénégal, que je connais très bien, parce que j'ai fait mes études doctorales. Si le Sénégal dit que le, la constitution autorise trois mandats, il n'y a pas de débat. Mais quand on dit trois mandats, que tu vas en faire quatre ou cinq, là, il faut protester. Donc, postuler, postuler à l'avance que non à trois mandats ne me semble pas démocratique. On ne peut pas faire quelque chose qui ne relève pas fondamentalement de nous-mêmes. Ça, c'est la première chose. Et quand on regarde euh, la démocratie, nous, nous nous sommes battus pour avoir la liberté. Et nous faisons comme si la démocratie s'apparente à la liberté, alors que c'est deux choses différentes. Nous n'avons pas encore acquis la liberté. Et je me demande hein, comment est-ce que la forme de démocratie qui va de pair avec la démocratie 
peut s'imposer dans un contexte où il y a ben, le, la forme de démocratie que nous, on veut nous promouvoir va de pair avec la liberté. Est-ce qu'on peut alors dans ce cadre la promouvoir ce type de démocratie alors qu'il n'y a pas la liberté Est-ce qu'on peut faire la démocratie dans un contexte où les gens ont faim, où les gens sont désorganisés, où les gens sont déstructurés Est-ce que la démocratie telle qu'on le dit là peut aller de pair avec cela Ça pose un problème. Alors je vais peut-être revenir avec ce que M. Sissi parlait de Bokinabé. Je suis, moi, l'expérience que je suis, je suis chef traditionnel en même temps que je suis universitaire. Et je vois bien tous les jours au village hein, comment les gens, quand j'arrive au village, la façon dont je suis en ville n'a plus rien à voir avec ce que je suis au village. Je veux même dire n'importe quoi, les gens vont faire. Et ça marche. Ça marche. Alors, est-ce que finalement... La démocratie participative dont on veut nous faire croire là ne peut pas s'accommoder dans un contexte comme le nôtre, puisqu'il faut contextualiser hein, avec ce qu'on dirait démocratie dirigiste, je ne sais pas quoi. Et moi, je voudrais dire que dans ce contexte-là, il est important de contextualiser la démocratie. Nous devons élaborer un concept de démocratie qui n'est pas ce qu'on a appelé le mimétisme étatique en reproduisant les États développés dans nos États, alors qu'en fait le contexte ne s'y prête pas. Three spaces for me uh, define how I'm looking at this. So the first is that way back in um, 2010, uh, I did a book um, uh, that focused on how civil society is governed in different countries uh, through legal instruments, policies, regulations, but also through non-legal tools. Uh, and, we, and what we noticed was that right across the continent, whether you're looking at East Africa, West Africa, North Africa, and Central Africa, there was the mushrooming of laws uh, that were developed by governments in order to control the operations of civil society in most cases. But at times it was to align the work of civil society to that of the state, especially when it came to the priorities uh, of the state. But I think overall, what we saw was the exchange of intelligence by different governments on how to manage and regulate civil society. So that, that book was done in 2010, and I tell you today, nothing has really changed in terms of how governments approach civil society, but also in terms of how civil society organizes itself. The second issue is that, um, as Gordon has just said, in 2021, we actually looked at the, the shrinking space for women and girls in Africa, uh, using the, the, I mean the institute to focus on you know, the state at which um, you know, democracy had either progressed or regressed. Uh, and, and, and clearly, what came out of that institute from the variety of papers and research that was done and the paper that I did for the institute was the fact that at, on, on the one hand, you, we could argue that the space for civil society is shrinking over time. start with that quotation from Michelle Mugo's Where Are Those Songs? And it is interesting that last month I began a presentation to the Gender Institute by citing her poem, To Be Feminist Is. And even as we reflect on her transition, um, I think it is fitting that I begin this presentation to the Governance Institute by citing this other poem, not only because there is no better way to assert the importance of her work and pay tribute to her, um, as we continue her legacy by con um, evoking her work in this space, but also because it captures so much of what I want to say. Um, let me just say that a lot of the comments that I am going to make are in conversation with some of the conversations that we had in Kampala last month at the Gender Institute, and I want to acknowledge that right at the beginning that um, I'm weaving in my own thoughts on the civic space and the work that we have been doing not only at Uraia, but in the Kenyan um, civil society space, broadly speaking, 
but also drawing from the insights that come out of that institute. Now originally this panel our, was under, the theme we had been given was safeguarding civic spaces, civil spaces in Africa. And I just want to um, piggyback on what Becky said. One of the things that um, a lot of the conversations that we are having has to do with this question of, as well as sh um, sh shrinking civil space, how do we talk about a shifting civil space? And I'm going to speak to four shifts in that area. Um, I also want to appreciate all the presentations this morning because it allows me, given the limited time that we have, to give you a shorthand and just gesture to different people. And also to Becky, thank you very much for that. So the question then that um, we want to ask this morning, um, Bayo kept referring to a number of actors, state actors, political actors, external actors, um, even civil society actors. But I think the thing that we must keep in mind is who is at the center of all these interventions that all these actors are doing and why are they doing it? And Atu Raya, the word Raya means citizens. And really what we want to put at the heart of what we want to talk about is that it is for the benefit of the citizens. If you want to say citizens, and I like the word citizens because citizens confers with it. I know it's problematic, but it does confer with it the sense of responsibilities as well as rights. And increasingly, we are also beginning to talk about this question of Utu, Utu Ubuntu, which um, Nishere Mugo asks us to think about in terms of the Zimbabwean greeting, I can only be well if you are well. What does that mean when we come to the civil space? Three terms that I don't have time to um, elaborate on, but the three terms that I'm really thinking around are this, this question of citizenship, the question of Utu Ubuntu and what does that mean, and thirdly, what do we mean when we talk about civil society? And Becky's already spoken to that, that beyond this idea of NGOs and this organized civil society, we really want to expand this, to think about all the ways in which people are influencing the state institutions and making their lives better. So the four shifts. The first shift um, really is about moving from centering the state and institutions or the public servants who serve them to centering people. Um, this focus on what does it mean when we say it is not about what people, what all these actors are doing, it is really about the impact on these actors. Um, this morning, I think Ismail um, alluded to this phrase by Anna Julia Cooper, only the black woman can say when and where I enter in the quiet undisputed dignity of my womanhood without violence and without suing or special patronage then and there, the whole race enters with me. And I think one of the constant running themes last month in Kampala was this question of why does gender matter? Why should Cordestria invest in the Gender Institute? And one of the things, I think we all came to consensus that our work on gender isn't just about bringing women into the space. It is about thinking about what happens when women and girls come into that space. It is about ensuring that everyone benefits from the struggle. But it also is about ensuring that everyone participates in that struggle. That when we start to think about gender, we bring in all the marginalized and marginalized, marginal communities, not because they're all female, but because it makes us begin to think about who is included and who is excluded in this space. And the gift in this regard that gender and feminist theorizing and experience and activism has presented us with is to examine not only who is in the room when we have these conversations, but to ask what the presence of these people means. And so we have concepts like intersectionality that begin to make us think about Things like this, what does it mean when women are on the streets? Earlier on, I think Godwin evoked the idea of youth on the streets. And I, I keep asking, how many girls are on the streets? When is it that girls feel safe enough to participate in particular struggles? What does it mean when they cannot be in the struggles? 
What does it mean when mature women, including those, um, um, for example, uh, as we saw in Kenya, where women went into the streets as mothers to demand from the government that their sons must be freed from detention. And when the state sent in its guns, they stripped their, the clothes from their bodies as to present themselves in their vulnerability. And people like, of course, Sylvia Tamale have, has theorized on what that means. So beyond asking the people, beyond saying the people, it is to ask what is the diversity of people who are in these civil spaces and what does it mean when more diverse constituencies come in? We can talk about democracy in that context, but it doesn't make sense because the military governance is the governance, is the democracy in that context. So how do we engage with military governance versus what we want democratic governance? I want to bring in a couple of new issues and says I have what is uh, possibly to engage. <laughs> that foreign donors actually also set a governance for Africa, a system which is outside of the democratic governance. So, I mean, if a third of African countries, if their budgets, their fiscal positions are actually funded by foreign donors. I mean, I'm just, I'll just give you the example. I mean, we talk, I mean, the, the trend in the country, on the continent now is looking at Rwanda and its growth in the last couple of years. But if you unpack uh, the economic growth, about just over a third of that growth is actually driven by foreign funding. So if the foreign funders, development funders tomorrow pull their money, the growth is gone. So what, I mean, that's just one example. So what does it mean from a governance point of view as a society if foreign donors and foreign development aid is so crucial and critical to a country? So how do we even debate? Because that sort of demands then of the governance of the development aid countries actually supersede a country's constitution. In, in many countries, like in South Africa, you have gangs in local regions that run regions or towns or townships. So it's a gang governance system. If you live some parts of Soweto or just play on Cape Flats in the Cape, really your day-to-day -day life is determined not by the country's constitution but a democratic system. By, by, by the law of the gangs. So again, another challenge um, to democracy, which we have to engage with. So I'm going to bring you two, two more issues in, which po possibly is a bit fluid. The one. I might want to make an argument that patriarchy, patriarchy in Africa is a system of governance. Whether it is, and I, 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 why I'm saying so, because you can cut patriarchy across culture, religion, political systems. Um, and Patriarchy goes against democratic principles. So we have to engage with it as a governance system that we have to tackle if we want to build um, democracy. I mean, there's a couple of other things, but I think I've captured essentially what I wanted to say. And apologies that I'm not speaking about technology, but now I'm hoping you can invite me again. <laughs>